Greetings, Chieftain here. Now, you may have noticed I've put on my YouTube channel from time to time the odd lecture, for lack of a better term. And the most recent one on the tank destroy history, well, it was kind of done on the fly with a bad microphone and so on. So we decided that since it still seems to be relatively popular, let's actually start a bit of a series of these things. And uh, we're going to start off with some fairly low-hanging fruit. If you've been around a couple of years, you may have watched the live stream of PAX, where I did a presentation I called Tank 101. And for a lot of you, this is really, really basic stuff. But I figure might as well just start off with the fundamentals so they're all on a level playing field. So in future videos, when we start getting into some of the more technical details, for example, you know exactly what it is I'm coming from and perhaps some of the other criteria that are required for tank design. So this is not uh, going to turn you into tank draftsmen. Uh, again, this is really, really basic knowledge of tanky principles. And I'm going to go on a little bit towards the end on how these tanky principles make their way into World of Tanks. Because, hey, this is the World of Tanks channel. Um, and also, if you should decide that you want to come and check out uh, our employment here with a job interview at wargaming.com slash careers. It might give you a heads up if you know exactly what it is you're talking about. Uh, and I'm not going to go into specific tanks really, it's just general overviews. So starting off, uh, I guess since this is a basic fundamental lecture, uh, who am I? Well, I'm Nick Morin. I've been hanging around tanks for 16 years, maybe a little bit more. Uh, but uh, outside of you know, a little bit of general knowledge about tanks, the fact that I'm a tanker doesn't really matter a heck of a lot. It's more a matter of what you read and how you educate yourselves. So uh, I've mentioned it before. If somebody comes online in your internet arguments and says, I'm a tanker and I have been for 20 years, that doesn't give many credence. So questions, let us start. Uh, and I have up in front of me a picture of a vehicle and hopefully the picture will now appear on your screen. Is this a tank? And really, it depends on which newspaper you read. Uh, by and large, people will look at it, and especially if they don't know any better, they will say, yes, it is a tank. Well, of course, many of you play World of Tanks. You are familiar with the concept of the SPG. You will recognize an SPG when you see one, I hope. And, well, that's it, exactly what you have here. It's an M109. Now, this is an interesting one, CB90. Now, the thing about this is, it's got a gun, which is much more powerful, armor, which is much better, and it's more mobile than any tank that you saw at the beginning of World War II. And there's no doubt that they were actually tanks. Is it a tank? Or this one. It looks like a tank. It's got a big gun. It's got direct fire. It's got armor. It's got tracks. And no, it's a tank destroyer, effectively. It's a sprut. So we have realized that perhaps the definition of what makes a tank isn't as simple as you might initially think. And this comes back also when I did this with the Tank Destroyer video. If you go click Linky, uh, it showed the difference between a tank destroyer and a self-propelled anti-tank gun. And there actually isn't one. It's just a matter of what you call it. Uh, finally, if you read the news, this is also a tank. Uh, and in common parlance, a tank is frequently said anything that runs around on the roads or anything else and has armor. Well, let's not go there. So at, at the larger end of things, you can make an argument that these are all tanks, all these four vehicles. On the top left, you have Leonardo da Vinci's tank. And uh, as a piece of trivia, if you look closely at the image, uh, you'll see that there was a deliberate design flaw that Leonardo put into his design so that if somebody stole his plans uh, and built the tank according to those plans, it would not work. Uh, so uh, have, have a look, see if you can figure it out and show off by putting it into the comments below. Uh, the SAR tank, we just put out a video very recently about it. Uh, go ahead and uh, watch, it's about five, five or six minutes on the SAR tank. Uh, the S tank, well, we all know about the S tank now because of the Swedish line. And a lot of people will say it's a tank destroyer. And the Swedes strongly disagree. As far as the Swedes are concerned, it is a tank. And finally, at the bottom right, you've got to put in the plug for hammer slammers. Uh, so good science fiction tanky sort of thing, if you're interested in that. But it has no tracks. Does a tank have to have tank uh, tracks to be a tank? And 
I would argue no. Uh, it is all about, well, what is the expected purpose of the vehicle? So in the future, if we have hover tanks, they're still tanks. So let us go on to a more philosophical question. Why do tanks exist? Well, your question is, what is the most important weapon in war? Is it a tank? Is it an airplane? Is it the radio? The pen is mightier than the sword. Was it uh, MacArthur said that whoever said the pen was mightier than the sword has never stared down automatic weapons? Uh, well, unfortunately for us tankers, no, it's Joe. The man and his rifle, uh, the only weapon that can take, hold, clear, do every tactical task that the army has in its doctrine, uh, is a man with his rifle. And tanks thus exist to support him. In fact, pretty much everything in the military exists to support the man and his rifle. There are some exceptions if you're doing specific naval, uh, naval engagements, blockades, for example. Obviously, riflemen aren't all that uh, important. And the, you go back far enough, that's a different, uh, different philosophical question entirely. Was it Themistocles said, uh, he who commands the sea is command of everything? Then again, the Greeks did like their water. So let's go back a little bit. 1914, there was a bit of an exchange of opinions. And uh, you had infantry with machine guns. Uh, so the solution to that is, well, let's bring armored cars up. The armored cars have been around you know, uh, pretty much almost since the invention of the car. So you're talking like 1906, maybe even earlier armored cars are uh, not uncommon. Uh, of course, the good thing about them, they're armored, they got machine guns, they can deal with opposition machine guns. The bad bit about them, though, is that they're pretty much confined to roads. And if you look at the terrain in, uh, let's say, Flanders, the Western Front, yeah, armored cars are not going to do well. So you needed to find some way of dealing with the terrain problem. So the solution appears. Uh, there were a number of different options. The SAR tank you just saw. Uh, the French had the, uh, the Boreau device, which really was more supposed to be a, a wire crushing device as opposed to a tank, but it did the same jo job. It went across no man's land. The British are the first at the door, as we all know, Little Willie and then the Mark I. And in credit to the French, they also invented the tank completely independently because the British weren't telling the French what they were up to. And at about the same time, the French also had the same idea. But they get it right with the FT, with the fully traversing turret, full length track, driver in the front, engine in the back, fighting compartment in the middle. Pretty much every tank ever since has followed this basic design philosophy. AMX-13, Merkava, that's pretty much the gist of it. Uh, of course, you've got the light tanks like Scorpion, whatever as well, but that's a little off to decide. So that was why the tank exists. Now let's get into a little bit of the uh, nomenclature and some of the design details as to why a tank looks the way a tank does. So what we have here is a diagram of a typical common or garden tank. It is, as you can see, an early model M4. And uh, various components, well, yes, the Army have helpfully labeled everything. If you want to zoom in and look at the individual components, like the 75 millimeter gun, the turret hatch. Uh, you can also see the prop shaft that goes from about halfway up the hull from the radial engine down to the base of the floor at the front with the transmission. And that's why the M4 is so high. Uh, however, the bottom line is that the bit you were looking for is the full tracked chassis. This is pretty much standard. Uh, I can't offhand think of any tanks today that don't have a full track chassis. Up at the front, you have the driving compartment. Today, it's just the driver's hole and nothing else. Back in World War II, you had also the bow gunner would be located in the driver's compartment as well. In the center, you have the fighting compartment. Uh, the fighting compartment can or need not include a turret. Uh, Bingo, the S-Tank, as we've seen before. But the terminology is good for assault guns and so on as well. The fighting compartment is where the crew actually fight the tank. The engine compartment, no guesses for what that does. It holds the engine. Uh, of course, the Navy did invent tanks, so that's why we have so many of the, the nautical terms like the hull, the hatches, and so on. Decks. 
Uh, so, your crewman, who's in it? Well, you got the driver. Very happy little individual, almost always sits at the front of the hull. Uh, there have been some exceptions uh, in the game. You got the Object 416, uh, you had the MBT 70. Uh, the part of the problem was uh, that you had to have a system that would allow the turret to traverse while still being connected to the hull and the tracks in the engine and so on. Didn't work out too well. Uh, the 416 had traverse limitations, the M5355 artillery piece that basically could only drive when the gun turret was facing straight forward, if I recall. The MBT-70 was, uh, the driver had his own little counter-rotating cupola. The turret went all 360s and he could drive and always face forward no matter what the turret was doing. The end result of that was he got a motion sick driver. Uh, so the bottom line was after many attempts, Nobody has as yet decided that it is a good idea to place the driver in the turret, at least for a general tank. There have been cases where the crew goes down into the hull, the T-14 for example being a recent case in point, uh, but again this is something of a rebellious concept. The gunner, well gee, what does he do? He controls the gun. Usually found in the turret at the front, sometimes in front of the commander, not always. The loader. Uh, this is the famous Bovington Cut and Half Centurion, and uh, nice thing about it is he shows you pretty easily the uh, amount of space he has to work with. This mannequin is short, uh, and you can also see, as a matter of tank design, uh, how much room the breech has to elevate to, before it hits the top of the turret, and that brings you to gun depression. We're going to be coming back to gun depression a little bit in the future. And finally, the tank commander. Uh, yes, you're the guy, you get to look all cool, you stand out on top of the tank, you feel... At... If you ever get the chance, be a tank commander. It's, it's a heck of an experience. Yeah, the whole shooting at your thing happens as well, but you get over that, usually. And the bog, the bow gunner. Uh, Son is also known as a radio operator, especially if he doesn't have a bow gun of his own to play with. Uh, he will usually be found at the front of the hull, next to the driver. And this was a position which was basically deleted shortly after the war. But in the 1950s, they decided it was a waste of space to have that extra man there. They didn't need him. It wasn't that critical for maintenance. And uh, the ability to shoot on the move was getting better. Uh, so there was no need for the bow gun, which was considered to be semi-stabilized, because no matter what the tank was doing, the bow gunner could still uh, adjust uh, free action. Whereas if you didn't have a stabilized gun, uh, the coaxial was useless on the move. Enter stabilized gun systems, the coaxial can fire on the move. There's even less argument in favor of the bow gunner. So he was soon deleted. Okay, design theory. You will be familiar with the Holy Trinity. Mobility, armor, and firepower. And as a general rule, especially in World War II era, in World War II era you could have any two of these three. So you could have armor and firepower, like in King Tiger. You could have uh, firepower and mobility, say an M18, but you didn't really have engines powerful enough and structures good enough to have all three at once. And so until the most recent generation of tanks, and still to an extent it's still valid, you do have that question between mobility, armor, and firepower. You have to make that balance. Uh, today, the engines are good enough that the tanks are plenty fast, but now you're talking into more operational and strategic mobility. You still have a 70-ton tank. So yeah, it can now do 40 miles an hour, but if the bridge that it tries to cross in you know, Africa or wherever it is uh, can't hold the weight of the bridge uh, of the tank, your mobility is still limited. So going into the three sections, starting off with mobility, because arguably this is the most important part of a tank. If you don't have mobility on a tank, you have a pillbox. And well, we've had pillboxes for quite a while. Performs two main functions. One is it allows you to cross obstacles, and the other is that it reduces ground pressure. Um, as you can see, of course, this uh, tank also uses tracks as additional armor. The value of it is highly questionable but it did make people feel better. So, uh, crossing obstacles. Uh, the general rule is if you have a wheeled vehicle, the bigger the wheel, the bigger the obstacles you can cross over. 
So I have a little drawing there, little, small little ball. You roll it along, it gets to a little, little bump, or a couple of you know, irregularities in the surface, it will stop. You get something big like a beach ball, that same irregularity which would stop a marble will not stop the beach ball. It will just crawl right on over. And again, the SAR tank we saw earlier was a perfect example of this. You use a huge radius wheel and it'll crawl over, in theory, anything. Uh, of course, you had a horsepower issue, but that's, a, that's another matter entirely. Now, how does this apply to the tank? If you think about it, the track is simply part of the circle without having to have the entire circle. So, World War I, you got the Rolls-Royce armored car, excellent armored car, but look how big the wheel arc is compared to the wheel arc on the Mark IV, uh, which you can see is huge. So the Mark IV has no difficulty getting over a lot of the obstacles that the Rolls-Royce would have because of that part of the radius. Now, gram pressure, that is weight divided by the contact area. And the purpose of this is that it allows you to cross soft ground so that you don't sink into it, which is a bit of a nuisance because when your tank gets stuck, it's really annoying to get it out again. So by way of a couple of examples, uh, Private Snuffy, uh, and if you don't know, Private Snuffy is also known as Joe, and he's your uh, stereotypical common garden infantryman. Let's say he weighs 200 pounds with a bit of gear, and your average foot ground pressure is about 16 pounds per square inch. If you're watching this in Europe, go convert it on Google. Uh, top right corner, I put it, say, uh, that was the weights are for a Crown Vic, it's the Lincoln version, whatever, town car. Two tons, 30 psi. And as a general rule, the, the ground pressure of a vehicle is going to be equivalent to the pressure in the tire, just if you're curious. Bottom left, you've got a heavy Hummer, an 1151. Now, this thing comes in at about six tons spread onto the four wheels and the pressure is now 40 psi. So you would now have three times, over three times the weight per square inch from the Humvee than you do from a person. But the M1 coming in at, you know, in this case, 67 ton is 15 psi. It's less ground pressure than Private Snuffy. So in theory, as long as Private Snuffy can walk across the surface of a bog or whatever without sinking into it, so can the tank. And this happened particularly, if I recall, back in the Falcons War. A uh, British tanky was driving around in his CVRT, uh, hopped out and immediately sank up to his knees, whereas the, uh, the Scorpion, or Scimitar, uh, just hadn't even broken the crust. All right, so a little bit more maths. If ground pressure is the weight of the tank divided by the length of the track multiplied by the width of the track, i.e. surface area, long tracks are better, right? Well, yes and no. Uh, the KV-6, we did not invent this. Uh, go online, it's, there's a wonderful backstory to the KV-6. Uh, this KV-6, there was actually another KV-6, which if I recall was a flamethrower, but the, this particular one, it's, it's quite amusing. Well, the problem with longer tracks is that it makes turning more difficult because when you're pivoting your track, the bits at the outside end have to go much further for the same arc of traverse. And this will build up dirt and as well as resistance. The dirt has a good chance of getting caught between the wheels and the track. It'll pop it off the center guide and you've now lost your track. You've walked it off, which is really annoying. Uh, so shorter, track length vehicles will turn better. Turning is accomplished usually by varying the speed of your tracks. So most people have figured this out by now. One track goes faster, inside track goes slower, you go around. There are a couple of quirks, for example, uh, track warping vehicles like the Tetrarch, uh, like the Universal Carrier. And what they will do is they will actually bend the track itself. Uh, and that will allow you to do nice gentle turns uh, without any of the issues of uh, loss of power due to the uh, various different steering systems. Um, very difficult to use on a heavier vehicle though, which is why you didn't see it on anything else. But it was an interesting way of getting around the problem. Now, of course, if you spun the wheel all the way around, one track would lock and then you'd spin normally, but uh, innovative. Okay. So between the track and the hull, you still have the suspension components, the wheels. And you had various different types, but generally speaking, you're looking at one of two, bogies or independent. 
Bogies were the oldest ones. Uh, they had uh, groups of usually little wheels all grouped together around a central pivot point. And the advantages to the bogey, well, firstly, it's easy to repair. If something goes wrong and your bogey gets blown up, whatever, simply unbolt the bogey, put new bogey back on, on you go. Uh, you have less localized pressure, less, less axle loading uh, per wheel because your weight is spread out over so many different parts of the track. Downsides. You generally had poor obstacle crossing. Because of the way the bogey is built, there's only so much travel that one of the wheels will go up. So you hit an obstacle, the wheel will go up a certain amount, and then it will hit its stop. So instead of riding over the obstacle, you now jump up uh, and your entire tank gets kicked upwards. Um, bogies were, generally speaking, starting to go out of service by the end of World War II. Uh, the Shermans were the last ones. The one notable exception, the British hung on to them for quite a while, uh, up through the chieftains, and uh, indeed the Israelis kept them going with the Merkava for a while. But uh, generally speaking, bogies went away. Replaced by independent suspension, so where every individual wheel is connected to its own suspension system. Uh, upside, usually these wheels are much bigger. And uh, you're, okay, Churchill, obvious exception for example, but generally speaking, independent road wheels are bigger than bogeyed road wheels. So you have less rolling resistance because there are fewer axles, and you have a better ride because it's better able to go over the obstacles. Again, this comes back to the huge arc, diameter, circle thing I was talking about earlier. Downsides, one, they have slightly higher localized pressure, and frequently they are harder to repair than bogies if you were to break one. So by way of example, the famous Christie suspension, it was the yes, S fantastic on the T34 BTs, uh, and it did make the tanks much faster, it did make them perform better tactically, but repairing one, if it broke, was a right pain. So the top image is of a T34, the springs you can see go all the way from the base of the tank to the top of the hull. The bottom image is one of the British cruisers and uh, the springs are missing, but you can see where they would go behind the armor plate. So your bogey breaks, a couple of bolts, replacement, you're done. A spring breaks on your Cromwell and all of a sudden you're removing track, you're removing wheels and you're removing armor plate. So that was one of the problems with the Christie suspension. And part of the reason is a little bit overrated. Uh, and it also took up a lot of internal volume that a bogey doesn't. Uh, torsion bars are the more typical form of suspension today. Uh, so that was just the track. Then you got to get the thing to go. And that means your engine. And factors which affect your engine, you're looking at horsepower, torque, weight, and fuel. So horsepower is basically how fast you go, torque is how quickly you'll get there. Or if you go up to a tree or a wall or something like that, how much of it you'll take with you when you go through. Engine weight is a factor. A lot of the early war engines were actually aircraft engines because they gave a high power to weight uh, output. Uh, later on, engines got more powerful, it was a bit less critical. But even today, if you look at, let's say, the turbine engine uh, on the image there for the M1, uh, it provides a lot of power for very little weight. And you know, you save a couple of hundred kilos here, a couple of hundred kilos there, soon you're talking some serious tonnage. And it does start to make a difference where you can add or reduce weight around the tank. Uh, even today, they're talking about replacing hydraulics with electrics, and that will save just simply, I think it's like a ton and a half um, with uh, hydraulic piping. Uh, fuel. It's got two factors. One is your fire chance, which is a little bit overrated, but I'm sure we'll come back to that in a future video. And the other is range. How far would you go on a single tank of gas? Now, the M1 is 503 US gallons, and you're pretty much looking for another fuel tank, uh, fuel truck within 100 miles. It'll go further if you're cruising the whole way, but in reality, you're never cruising at a constant speed for 250 miles, except on the test range. And this would be a factor all the way down through the war, of course. So uh, even in the race across France, uh, the Allies were limited by the amount of fuel that they could get through. And that's another argument entirely. So yeah, you have the logistic issue, how do you get the fuel from, let's say, the UK to France, and you know, hence you got Pluto, a pipeline under the ocean. 
but then once it got onto the land, you had to get it into the tank itself, and that was by jerry cans, or, or in the British terms, they had flimsies, they were called. And you're talking about filling up several, you know, 80 gallons, let's say 100 and something gallons, with individual cans. This is really annoying and takes a very long time. So the less you can do it, the better. It's more efficient on your logistic tail, it's easier on the crewman, so on and so forth. So ideally you want to get the best possible range for your tank as you can. Which then brings you to the diesel versus petrol question. And diesels will get you further range, but back in World War II era, they weren't quite as powerful as they needed to be compared to the petrol engines, or gasoline if you're American. So that's why most tanks around the world were using gasoline. Firepower. Well, these are some of the factors that affect firepower. Accuracy is one of them. Rate of fire, shell type, penetration, and vision. And then, of course, in the game terms, damage done at the other end. If any of these things fail, the purpose of the tank is gone. So, for example, vision. He who sees the enemy first will probably shoot first and will probably win. It's something that a lot of people don't look at when they evaluate a tank. Say, oh, the Panther had the uh, L70 gun, which is huge penetration and very accurate. Yes, but if you can't find a target to hit it in the first place, what good is your gun doing? On the other hand, you may have the best vision in the world and auto tracking and so on, but if your gun will just ricochet off the target, what's the point? So you do have that balance as well, but they're all different factors, different tanks achieve them to different levels. So things that affect accuracy, the speed of the round. And this does two things. One, it reduces the amount of lead that you need to hit the target. Try hitting a light tank in World of Tanks with a KV-2 that's you know, careening along at 50 kilometers an hour versus try doing it with something a little bit faster like a Panther. Uh, you'll see obviously that the faster round is more likely to hit, it's easier to aim. The other issue is arc of flight. So you lob around, it goes whee in order to hit. Do you like the sound effect? Uh, as opposed to the high velocity round, which is simply flat. Now, the reason that is important is because, uh, especially back in those days, your arc could be quite high. You had to know exactly how far away your target was. Otherwise, you'd be lobbing it. If you're off on range, you'll either go over your target or you'll fall short of the target. If you have a flat trajectory weapon, yeah, estimate the range close enough that chances are you will hit it. And that goes into the whole battle site range uh, question, which I've talked about elsewhere. Also, if you're a hunter, you may know it as maximum point blank. Stability of the round. Well, that also comes into the accuracy. If the round is doing this as it wobbles down range, the chances are A, you will miss it, and B, you may be uh, reduced effectiveness because your round will simply twist instead of punching straight through. And this was particularly an issue with uh, early Sabo ammunition, 1944-45, and it took quite a while before the US was particularly impressed by the, the stability of the Sabo round that they had converted finally to using it. The quality of the sight. Well, if you, if you aim at a fuzzy thing and your reticle sucks, you're probably not going to hit it. Quality of stabilization if you're firing on the move. Early British tanks, the stabilization was the gunner, crouching down on his knees, and he'd be kind of bending his knees as the tank did this. It was very basic, but it kind of worked. After that, though, when the gun started getting heavier, more than about a six pounder, you had to start using mechanical stabilization, and that basically was confined to the American tanks until just after the post-war era. And don't forget, just because the gun is stabilized, the crew are still being thrown around. So it's, you're never going to get it quite as accurate as the, as the manufacturer says it will be. Uh, accuracy of the data, that goes back also to the arc of flight. So how far away is your target? Today you've got crosswind sensors, you've got humidity checks, you've got temperature checks, uh, how many rounds have been fired from your barrel already, so that's the wear of the barrel. Uh, it's, these days, it's, uh, it's actually very fascinating the amount of data that goes into every calculation before you fire the round. And finally, the range of motion of your gun. You know, how, how easily, how quickly can you place it, uh, a, your gun onto target in the first place? All right, so that's simply getting a shell onto the target. So then you have rate of fire. Rate of fire has a couple of different factors. Firstly, obviously, how many uh, targets you can engage in a certain amount of time. 
uh, things which affect your rate of fire. Uh, the size of the round. Bigger rounds will take longer. How many loaders do you have? If you got a two-piece ammunition, you may be better off with two loaders instead of just a one. How much space do you have to work with? If there is only a very limited amount of space for you to manipulate that round, uh, then it's probably going to take you longer to get the round out through this one path within your turret into the breach and up that it would be if you could just pick the round up any way you got it and immediately slam it into the breach. So if you've been following me inside the hatch videos, you probably have a vague idea of the differences by now. Uh, number of pieces per round already mentioned, time to aim. So what usually happens is that your rate of fire is not actually limited by how fast your loader can put rounds into the breach, especially the first couple of rounds, he's very good. Uh, towards, after the first 10 or, 10 or 12 rounds, depending on the tank, things really start slowing down though. Even in the modern Abrams, for example, there's what we call a sweet spot that you can take the rounds out really quickly, but then you start reaching around other parts of the uh, ready rack. It takes longer to get the round into the tube. Uh, but for aiming purposes though, the gunner still has to find the target, lay on the target, and then finally engage. This takes time. Then when you fire around, you've got obscuration, the dust and the dirt that's been kicked up. You can't see where your round landed maybe. So even if you hit the target, you still have to wait for the dust to clear before you can see the effects on target and then either acquire and lay onto a new target or service it again. So by and large, acquisition is at least as important as how fast you can put rounds into the tube. And finally, have autoloaders. Well, the nice thing about autoloaders, well, there's several advantages, uh, one of which is they don't get tired. Uh, but when your magazine runs out, that's it, you're hosed. So what happens when your shell hits the target? So you have shot, which is basically a solid piece of metal, armor-piercing high explosive, Armor piercing composite rigid, AKA high velocity armor piercing, armor piercing discarding Sabo. These are all kinetic energy rounds. And that's quite simply the mass by the velocity of the round into a, an area of a certain size. Once it makes the hole, you will have uh, little pieces of metal fly around inside the target vehicle and generally gives everybody a bad day. Over penetration is a thing. If you fire today, let's say, a modern Sabre round at something as toughly armored as a BRDM, you have an excellent chance of a round going in one side, going out the other side, nothing, not hitting anything important or anyone important on the way, and all of a sudden people inside are going, what the heck was that? There's two little holes inside the vehicle. To deal with those, you need a different type of ammunition. Those are your chemical effect rounds. Heat is the most prevalent high explosive anti-tank, and that is a cone of explosives that when it detonates, it collapses, it creates a plasma jet, which then punches through the armor. The advantage of that is it doesn't matter how far away you are when you shoot, the effectiveness is always the same. And finally, you have HEP or HESH. The US Army has gone away from HEP uh, since they went to the 120. The British still very much like it. And what this does is it, it lands a cow pat of explosive onto the armor, faces off against it, then detonates, and the shock waves will then blast through the armor, causing bits on the inside or fixtures to break off and then fly around and give people inside a bad day. What affects uh, penetration? Well, as a general rule for a kinetic energy round, how fast it's going and how heavy it is. So that's why a lot of them are made of depleted uranium, tungsten, heavy metals. For a chemical effect round, it's how wide is the shell, the diameter of it, and it goes up in a, on an exponential basis. And finally, you also have little quirks like normalization, shatter gap, and so on. Normalization is the tendency when a round hits to turn into the armor plate, and it increases the effectiveness. And that was one of the problems he had with those tanks that saw tracks on the outside as additional armor, was that the, the, the tracks are made of a softer steel, they're not armor plate. So what would happen is that an incoming penetrator will hit the track, hit the softer metal, turn into the soft metal, because that's what normalization does, and now it is going at almost the same speed directly into your armor plate. 
And the cost for this increased vulnerability is that you've increased the wear and tear on your tank. And that's, again, a topic for another day. Gun depression, perhaps the most important stat in the game that nobody pays attention to. As a general rule, tanks with more depression will provide a smaller, defensive target, and they will shoot earlier if they're going over a hill. Um, if your tank has good gun depression, the chances are it is a taller tank and easier to hit if it's not in a, a defensive position. So the two pictures we have here, one is an Abrams, one is a T, uh, probably a 72. And you can see that the T-72, although it is a smaller tank, actually is providing a larger target because it has to go further over the hill in order to get the gun low enough uh, to shoot. But if you're attacking over open ground, if you're in an offensive-oriented army, you probably want the T-72 because it's smaller and harder to hit. So, the effectiveness of armor. And this is now a trade-off between weight and volume. You still awake? More volume means more room inside the tank that needs to be protected. This means you need more metal to protect the tank, which means that for the same amount of weight, you have less armor effectiveness. And that's one of the reasons for autoloaders. You make the tank smaller, you get more armor for the weight. Angled armor increases protection, but reduces internal space. So that's why you don't see it as much anymore. Uh, you, the T-34, for example, is lauded for it had ar angled armor everywhere. Yes, it did. It made it pretty hard to penetrate. It also made it pretty hard to operate because you just didn't have the space. By way of an example of what the practical effects are, uh, again, you can get the, there are calculators online you, if you are that curious. You see, uh, with a little bit of slope, not much happens for the first 10 or 15, 20 degrees. Once you get over a certain level though, that little bit more slope starts really increasing the effective horizontal thickness of the armor plate. The last uh, requirement today, and uh, this was a topic we had at uh, one of the Operation Think Tank discussions was, okay, we've had the Holy Trinity, should that be modified? And the fourth answer that came out was communications. The ability of a tank to talk to every other tank, let them know what is happening, situational awareness. In World of Tanks terms, that means look at the little mini map in the bottom right corner of your screen. Too many people seem to ignore it. But today, it's radio. So it used to be signal flags way back in the day. When, when, you, when you started off, uh, if you recall, it used to be like the light detractor had signal flags as a radio. That was what they actually used. And you had to hope that somebody's looking at their little slit in their cupola in the right direction at the right time to see what was going on. Then he got up to the radio, and yes, that is actually me on the radio there on the left. Uh, and that is simple verbal communication. Now you've got Battlefield Command Systems, they're called. So FBCB2, Blue Force Tracker, you're probably familiar with it. It's a little computer screen inside the tank that can be used to indicate where you are, where the enemy is, send email messages to each other, what have you. Uh, but uh, they say the most dangerous thing on the battlefield is a man with a radio who knows how to use it. And if he's got a tank, so much the better. All right, so we're getting to the end. So how are these things applied in the game? So again, this is if you're a relatively new player and you, you're trying to use real world tactics or real world knowledge in the game because, hey, I'm a tanker. I know how to tank in real life. Why can't I tank well in the game? Real individual tactics do work for the individual tank level. So th those tactical things like berm drills, moving on low grounds, hold down positions, go to the Chieftain Teachers video on use of cover, this sort of thing works. However, once you get above that, inter-tank tactics are a bit more gamey. So in a real tank platoon, each tank is shooting a different target. There's no point in shooting multiple tanks at one target. It, it's inefficient, one tank should do the job. In our game, however, it's the opposite. As much as possible, everybody focus on one poor bugger and just melt him. Spotting is a bit quirky in the game compared to what you would expect in real life. So just, again, go to Chief and Teach Spotting. I've covered this. Uh, and there are some pretty egregious cases of gameism, uh, and artillery is a case in point. And, yeah, well, that's a topic of discussion for another day. So other gameisms. How many tanks, how many hit points does a real tank have? And obviously the answer is none. Yeah, generally speaking, if it penetrates, you're done. 
In World War II, eh, one penetration might keep going. Two penetrations, you're probably getting the idea you're having a bad day, and if the third penetration doesn't kill you, the chances are you're getting out of your tank anyway, because you don't want to hang around for the fourth. A trend has started. Uh, critical hits, and this is, now I'm gonna divert a little bit. And I find this is a cultural divide between traditional war gamers and say MMO players for World of Warcraft or what have you. Apparently, and I did not know this, in many online games, a critical hit means that you've done extra damage, double the damage points or whatever. I come from games like Harpoon, where a critical hit is like it is in the game. It's a module. It may do no damage whatsoever to the integrity of the, of the vehicle or vessel, but it reduces its capability. So that was just a little, a little curious aside I discovered coming from historical war games. And then, of course, you've got the question of historical accuracy versus game balance. Well, I hate, I hate to say it, if you have to lose one or the other, game balance will win because we're trying to keep this a fun game. So the 10 classes in the game, how do they relate to historically? Well, in World War II, of course, you did have light tanks, medium tanks, and heavy tanks. Sometimes it would be known as the infantry tanks and cruiser tanks if you're British. But generally speaking, yes, the, the roles are slightly different between a heavy tank and an infantry tank, but generally speaking, they have the same general characteristics. Tank destroyers generally would be glass cannons. Yes, you have the Jagdtiger and things like that, but they tended to emphasize mobility and firepower at the cost of armor. And of course, artillery. It's, artillery is a force multiplier. Artillery cannot do anything on its own. It's useless on its own or nearly useless, especially in the game. Uh, but what it can do is it can apply its firepower in addition to someone else's firepower. So if you're a one guy on the, off on the flank and you have artillery on the radio, you are not just a 120 millimeter cannon, you're a 20 millimeter cannon plus a six inch gun. After the war, light, medium, uh, correction, light and heavy tanks started to die off. The roles were simply taken by MBTs, main battle tanks. Artillery, of course, remained and tank destroyers, they changed their nature. They became missile armed, generally speaking, or very specialized vehicles. And uh, finally, in-game effects, well, artillery, controversial, shall we say. Uh, the idea is that it's supposed to hit stationary targets, whether it happens in the game, well, you can argue it. Uh, there are a few penalties for moving in the game. In real life, you can, uh, you, when you're driving along, your accuracy is reduced, your ability to reach ammunition is reduced. In the game, Tanks can come along at full speed, firing as fast as possible. It doesn't matter what's happening to the tank, so just watch out for that. Instant reactions. You can go from full forward to full reverse very quickly in a World of Tanks tank. In a real tank, you go full forward, then you stop, and then you fight to put the gear shift into, into the reverse position, and then you go off another, uh, the other direction. Uh, what we call peekaboo tactics are questionable in real life. Spotting mechanisms, well, things will vanish in, real, in plain sight in the game. I refer you back to the Chieftain, spot, uh, Chieftain Teacher's spotting video. Very short engagement ranges in our game. In World War II, your typical engagement range was about 800 meters uh, to 900 meters. In our game, everything is between 50 to 300, generally speaking. There are some up to 500 you can shoot, but generally speaking, not. What this will result in is A, face hugging and ramming, which we don't like to do in real life. And what they argue is Russian bias. And this is just simply a matter of the game mechanics because the Soviets were not known for having the most accurate uh, weapons and having thick armor, which happens to work very well when you're up close and personal. Whereas the Germans who had the highly accurate long range guns, they, they can't really use their advantages so much in the game, which Coincidentally, it did seem to happen in World War II. So you go around Normandy, let's say, uh, those extra long ranges that the Germans had, because of the close terrain, they couldn't use it. So the Allied tanks were able to get up much closer before an engagement happened. So that reduced the German advantages there. And other things, okay, tracks get repaired really quickly in the game. In reality, what will happen to your track will die in mud snow, ice, rain, anywhere where it is not pleasant and not fast to fix. So you throw a track, you're at least out probably for an hour, maybe four or five, depending on how bad it is. 
in a game 15 seconds. I would love my loader to do that. Um, some of the other module effects, well, we can cover those. Uh, plenty of game tutorials out there you can have a look at. Just things to note as a contrast to what you would expect from a real tank. Anyway, that basically is Tank 101 and how it goes into the game. So hopefully I haven't bored you too much, but uh, again, this is just designed to give you a basic fundamental of what a tank is and how to think about them. In future episodes, we're gonna go into slightly more historical issues. Uh, I believe the next one is going to be the Battle of the River Plate. That was that, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you didn't know anything about tanks already, if you did, well, hope you're still awake. I'll see you on the next one.